Today's Editor's Note podcast is brought to you by Lando's Nerf Sanctuary. Do you pine for simpler times? Well, Lando's is your chance to relive the glory days of the galaxy. Come herd real nerfs on an authentic nerf ranch. Find out what it really takes to be a scruffy looking nerf herder for yourself. Do you, do you want to do this one? I, I can if you want me to. <laughs> take, take that bold step. Welcome to the Editor's Note Podcast, Central Maine's best comic book cod... Uh, co- cod, cod, cod piece. <laughs> you want to try that again? Welcome to the Editor's Note Podcast, Central Maine's best comic book podcast. By default, I'm local internet celebrity, Jared, just like everybody else. And with me is the owner of the Editor's Note comic book store in downtown Hollowell, Zach! Hello! Second time. <laughs> yeah, well, the first time didn't go as... Uh, Smoothly as planned, but that's what you called it a cod cast. A cod, well, I was just reading an article about Cape Cod and a very voluptuous sand mermaid sculpture. See, there was a great white off of Cape Cod too that some kid reeled in. Oh, really? I Terrifying. Just... Don't go in the water. There are sharks there. It's Jaws. Stay away from the ocean. <laughs> Apparently, the ocean is death. That's what Jaws taught me. Maybe he's like doing his Pokemon Go thing out there. <laughs> yeah, that kid caught his water type. <laughs> he did, yes. Big, big combat points, as the kids say. I'm going to steal from the meme. Everyone's playing Pokemon, and Blink-182 just released an album. What year is this? <laughs> I'm not into the Pokemon Go. I tried it. I don't like it. Everyone that I work with is trying it, and I was like, I'm not going to do it. It's not going to do teenagers. it. Not going to do it. My willpower lasted all of a day. I downloaded it this morning, and uh, I'm, I'm dabbling. I'm trying to meet the kids where they are. Local internet celebrity and uh, Pokemon trainer. Add that to my list of... <laughs> titles have you caught them all no no I... pocket monster what do you mean pocket monster that's what it means oh see i that... even i never played pokemon as a kid yeah it's just abbreviated for pocket monster oh i i've got several but it's it's weird i think it's uh it's an interesting new step into the world of augmented reality games it's going to be very very interesting it i mean it helped nintendo a, a ton their stock has gone up. I think the value of the company has increased by like $7 billion since they released it last week. A lot of car repair companies car. are in business. Some of the stories are outrageous. This young girl found a dead body while looking for Pokemon. Or that kid who was live streaming and witnessed a murder. <laughs> or the guys that like sent out a beacon to draw people in and they then summarily robbed at gunpoint a bunch of 17-year-olds. Yeah, and now they're being charged as adults. But to be fair, the kid with the neck tattoo... He didn't have much of a chance in this world. No probably. I mean, there are a lot of fine people that have neck tattoos, I'm sure. Nope. Uh, I'm trying to think of somebody with a neck tattoo that's, you know, not bad. How's that going? Uh, I'll get back to you. <laughs> I'm going to Google nice people with neck tattoos. It's a weird Google search. I'm willing to go the extra mile for this show. <laughs> Mother Teresa. If she had a neck tattoo that we didn't know about... Remember that hoax for a while that Mr. Rogers wore long sleeves all the time because he had sleeve tattoos because he was in the Vietnam War? Yeah, that was just an internet rumor that people took as fact. It wasn't real. How was your week? It's uh, It's been good. It's been busy. Uh, you know, a big weekend. Did a lot this weekend. I feel like I haven't seen you in forever. A, a whole 24 hours. <laughs> I've seen you so much recently. Uh, it's unsettling. You see a lot of me this <laughs> week. We'll continue to see more of you. Such is life. I think we need a break. Uh, well, I think there's I think one coming up. We we just we'll have a quick parting kiss and then we'll be on our way. Uh, well, so I don't. We'll just. I don't know. think this needs to be a, a a kiss. Just just a quick one on the lips. Just it's, a, it's been too long since we've done that. It's. Not, I don't know how I feel about this because that's <laughs> never happened. I'm seeing some really interesting neck tattoos after this Google search. Not really seeing anybody. I, I hate to be like that's just there's a guy that has an eyeball coming under his chin. That's unsettling. Yeah, I don't like that at all. I think you might be right about neck tattoos. Although you're right, plum in the middle. You're the Oreo. You're the cream of the tattoo shop Oreo. I am. In Hollowell, <laughs> are you afraid that you're gonna be involved in some sort of altercation between the two tattoo studios on either side of you? Like there, it's like you're in the middle of a tattoo turf war. No, I can't imagine that's gonna happen. Oh. I sang a lot of great uh, 90s songs along with a cover band the other night. Yeah, that Stacy's mom has been stuck in my head ever since. I know. Then. We should go out more often. <laughs> Instead of staying in the basement. Ran into uh, El Diablo and all uh, all of that, so it's good terrifying. times. It was terrifying. <laughs> Inside stories on a public podcast. That was alienating for everyone. Yeah, well, if you want to know more, tweet at me and I'll tell you all about it. <laughs> time for the news. <laughs> okay, it is time for the news. Before we get started, does anyone want to get out? 
It's time for the news. It was announced today that Fox TV has made a deal with Marvel, and they're going to be putting a new X-Men TV show on Fox. Really? I don't care. Well, you burned me, X-Men. You burned me bad. Is Charles going to get lost and be gone? And Is it going to be all about the young kids of the school, and we never get to see Charles and all the cool X-Men? No, it's like the Underground Railroad for mutants. It's about like two parents who discover their kids a mutant, and then they have to like shuffle them all around underground. So this is kind of like... It's going to be a lot like Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D.? I hope not. Don't be like Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. Don't be Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. Never be Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. I finished it. I finished that the third season. Thoughts? I'm so glad all the generic pretty boys are dead. All right, there we go. You know what we got on Friday? It's Tuesday now. Well, I know there's a variety of things going on on Friday, but uh, Friday um, must be the release of something. A five-minute Star Wars trailer. For Rogue One or for... Yeah, yeah, for Rogue One. Really? Star Wars Celebration this weekend. They're doing, releasing a five-minute trailer. On so Friday. much trailer. On Friday. Yeah. I know what we're doing Friday night. That's <laughs> so sad. The news is so light this week. Like, we got a trailer coming. You know that, huh? <laughs> a five-minute trailer. Yeah, that's so long. What do you want to see? What do I want to see? Yeah. No. In the trailer? I think it might be, like, clip and then trailer. Because that's a lot. That's a lot of trailer. I want to see Vader doing something badass, like we've talked about. I want to see... A flowing cape. You just want to see the flowing cape? I just want... Everyone has a flowing cape. I want to see if there's any lightsaber action. I kind of want to see some Emperor. Give me some Emperor. Yeah, I don't know. He, I mean, he could still do it. I don't know. Some Forrest Whitaker doing some cool old guy stuff. Um, spectacle. But don't ruin it for me. Don't ruin it for me. I feel like there's a big reveal that they haven't done yet, that there's got to be something else there. Do it like the Entertainment Weekly magazine. All this is, they'll just like, put text up on the screen of what it is. Yeah, yeah. Enter Vader. Yeah. But and just have an animatic of it, not actually show us the real Vader. We, kn- we know what he looks like. So we got Star Trek coming up in just a couple of weeks. Yes. Yeah, that's it for the news? No. Oh. This is part of the news. Oh, okay. You just because I, I know the content of the show today is Star Trek. I'm, I could have used this as a segue at the end. I'm choosing not to. Okay, fair enough. I'm just going in with it. All right. Uh, it came out that Star Trek is going to have its first gay character. Oh, I did see this. Yes. Yeah. Which the irony is, it was already portrayed by a gay man. That wasn't. It's not irony. It was meant to be an homage. Which, by the way, George Sakai is pissed. Oh, he gets pissed. He was more like they came to me and asked. I said, Oh yeah. By the way, it's Sulu. Yeah, there if you haven't figured that out. Yeah, he's, um, it's going against Gene's vision. It makes it seem like the character had been closeted. And the thing that's also interesting is Zachary Quinto, who is is out as uh, gay, is disappointed that George isn't a fan of it. He, like, he's disappointed he's not he, with somebody other than Sulu. He always, but I like I get the mentality, because Simon Pegg was like, look, we wanted it to be an established character, so that in, it's not tokenism, and you're not going to do like, this character is now only defined as gay. At the end of the day, just remember, it's the alternate timeline now. Well, also, outside of Spock and McCoy and Kirk in the original series, who the hell else had a personality? To- Sulu's personality was, he flew the ship, there was that one episode where he fenced, and then later he was a captain and drank tea. And yes. that's about it for Sulu. Uh, could have been gay. The captain of the Excelsior. In which he called himself the master of the vessel. He could have been gay. I don't, there's never anything to say that he's not. No. And I guess what, what they have um, in the new movie is Sulu has, I'm not sure if it's a husband or just a boyfriend, but they have a kid together. Ah. Uh, um, they're all in. I'm all for it. It's weird that Star Trek, which is supposed to be this like very inclusive universe, has never had that. They've touched on it like twice. Yeah, but also it's like when you look at that vision of the future, Gene Roddenberry's vision of the future, what it, does it matter? Because one of the big things that always stands out to me is Patrick Stewart, one of my favorite quotes about the series, is he was talking about how you're going to have a bald captain, and the captain is going to be bald. Wouldn't they have found a cure for baldness in the 24th century? And Gene goes, in the 24th century, nobody's going to care. So I think that's probably a, a part of it, is nobody re- in the 24th century, nobody really gives a fly, and you know what? Live and let live, man. But, yeah. Gay Sulu. Um, <laughs> what I like about it is that they... Would- <laughs> so he sends it, like, oh, no. Gay Sulu. I like they. Um, it's like saying light beer. They went to George Takei and they said, "Hey, we were thinking about doing this as an homage to you and everything that you've done." What do you think? He goes, "I don't really like it." And then they did it anyway. <laughs> nothing, oh my! Nothing like celebrating someone with them going no, and then doing yeah. it anyway. <laughs> Here, would you like this? 
Would you like this uh, bouquet of flowers to celebrate? No. Well, here's a bouquet of flowers. Celebrate. So in the world of Twitter, I don't really do anything other than follow comic book creators just because, you know, it's my job. Yes. You want Which drama do you want first? Ooh, uh, well, I need, like, option. I can't just be like, uh, drama A or drama B. Give leak, me some... leak drama or race drama? Uh, well, let's segue from the Sulu stuff. We'll stay heavy for a minute, and then we'll hit the leak drama. So give me the race drama. An issue of Silver Surfer came out last week, which is fine. It's a nice little book. It's written by Dan Slott. It's a very small book. It's light. It's self-contained. Yes. But there were two panels where Silver Surfer saved the world, and people are celebrating him everywhere. Thank you, Silver Surfer. Yeah. Good on you. Yes. Uh, much obliged. Lots going on around here. But then he goes to see Hamilton. Except they don't That's have... That's very topical. They don't have the licensing rights for Hamilton. So they had to make everyone, without getting into copyright infringement, everyone had to be white. Uh-oh. <laughs> the internet got so angry. I can imagine that it would. <laughs> and there's like, we legally couldn't have them black. They were originally black. We reached out. We couldn't do it. We had to change it. But the internet lost its damn mind. Like, white Hamilton! No one wants Hamilton. Well, good on Silver Surfer for going to get some culture, though. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to spin this in a positive light. Silver Surfer, is, he's pretty shiny. Um, I'd say he's like shine Cajun, maybe? Is that a thing? Can we call it that? I feel like we're pushing the envelopes of this show already. Why? It's it was just this dumb thing. It was just about yeah. It's absolutely foolish. Copyright infringement and the people got so angry. about They probably got angry if you like you know see Le, like Les Mis. Maybe don't, Silver Surfer's already seen Les Mis. Cats is Cats don't. still? Going? I hate both of those shows. You don't like Les Mis? No. What the hell's wrong forever. with you? You don't have to sing everything. It's it's Broadway, dude. That's it's you a don't musical. Have to sing everything. It's a musical. Yeah, and then everyone's What's wrong with you? No, that's a terrible musical. Never watch Les Mis. Oh, shut up. I hate that show. What about Rent? Do you like Rent? Yeah, I like Rent. They sing everything in Rent. No, they don't sing everything yes, in Rent. Yes, they sing everything in Rent. No, they speak. There's lines well, of dialogue. Okay, not very many lines of dialogue. If you're just having a regular conversation, you don't need them to be sung. They, very, uh, 98% of Rent is sung. Yeah. And that 2% makes it fine. It's like 99%. Of Les Mis is sung. No, 100%. Yo, and you, but you claim to like opera. That's all sung. I don't really like opera. I've gone to operas. Oh. And you did not like them because they were all singing? Well, I don't really understand Italian. Oh, well. I can't believe you don't like Les Mis. No, not at all. What about um, Phantom? Yeah, I'm fine with that. All right, so you're not like totally against like French-based musicals. <laughs> yeah, it's all about... The... So just so far, I'm racist against the French and neck tattoos. What? Why? <laughs> Why don't you like cats? Because there are a bunch of damn cats running around. That's so why it's annoying. That's why it's called cats. Oh. It's not called humans. Ugh. I don't. I haven't seen it in years. I no. Cats is not my deal. The magical Mister Mistopheles just doesn't get you going. I hate all those cats. What about memories? You own a friggin' cat. He's fine. What if he started singing? He's not a good cat. He's more like an incompetent dog. He's yeah. He's he struggles. But what if what if your cat started singing? That would be terrifying, and I would run. <laughs> wow. Uh, I'm trying to think of other musicals that I like and are good that you probably don't like because you're an uncultured, unwashed piece of filth. Sorry, how many Broadway shows have you been to? I've seen Les Mis. I've seen on Broadway. Yeah. Did you really? I saw Les Mis on Broadway. Oh, good for you. I saw Phantom in the West End of London. Look at that. Cultured. Right there. Um, At least you have some defense. So when you said that, you raised your craft beer. Oh, yeah. I've got uh, Shipyard Summer rolling through the uh, the glass today. Yeah. You almost thought that yourself, too. I almost bought that myself. <laughs> well, it's, you know, I'm glad to have some sort of compensation for spending my Tuesday nights in your basement. <laughs> the mac and cheese dinner and beer. God, that sounds so predatory. Like, come down to my basement and I'll give you beer. <laughs> come, come spend some time at my basement. I'll give you mac and cheese and beer, and you can play Pokemon Go. <laughs> I'll have a cappuccino after that. Oh, there we go. That was a Cosby reference. I was just glossing over it because that's just wildly insensitive. Um, So that was the internet going crazy over kind of a nothing thing. I can understand. Yes, whitewashing is a persistent issue, but when you're dealing with... Just general copyright claim. What can you do? Then why not? Why don't you send the Silver Surfer to a different show other than Hamilton? If you can't do it, because gonna... the art was done by then. I mean, everything was in. Oh, and it was only two panels. They you can't, written, you they can't rewrite couple... the two panels where he goes to you know 
That's a what's another popular. It's not that fast to be able to turn around art. Yeah, uh, maybe they should have like figured out ahead of time. Yeah, probably. That's true. I'm just. I'm gonna. I'm gonna say that. Yeah, you probably should have known before you drew the panels whether or not you could do the Hamilton thing. Yeah, find out about your rights. Come on, licensing. Yeah. So it, you know, instead the Silver Server could have gone to something like how to succeed in business without really trying. Do you like that musical? Never seen it. Can't give an opinion on it. Oh, there you go. Oh, what about yeah. Rocky Horror Picture Show? Would you call that a musical? Yeah. Do you like it? Yeah. Have you ever seen like a live one? No, but that would be fun. Oh, it's a friggin' blast. I went dressed up as Brad Majors. Why wouldn't I enjoy a sweet transvestite? From transsexual Transylvania? <laughs> Are you going to remove the cause but not the symptom? I'm all done. Oh, I could go on all night. <laughs> you probably will. Let's go on. That, to that's a, also the point of a podcast is to go on. Yes. Just continue. Move, moving forward. Putting I'm your heads down. forward to the next bit of news. Um, so yesterday, the other bit of comic book controversy is... See this right here? Uh, yes. This is a Marvel preview magazine. Which is really good that we're looking at a visual medium on a verbal and vocal and auditory. Hey, you can find this online. It's everywhere now. But it's a free preview magazine. It's supposed to come out tomorrow. Well, it's free. Yeah. So. But within that magazine are a ton of reveals for what Marvel is going to be doing this fall. As far as new titles they are starting, different stories that are coming up. It was supposed to come out tomorrow. So you're getting a sneak peek, but the show comes out tomorrow, so it doesn't really matter. So is it really news, then? But what the news is... The unbeatable squirrel girl? Yeah. What is that? Girl who has a squirrel. Uh, yes. Apparently she's unbeatable. Yeah. That's <laughs> that's the fun of the book. But this ended up getting leaked online, and all of Marvel's reveals totally got spoiled two days in advance by Bleeding Cool, who are a pariah of a website. They're the worst. Question. If the unbeatable squirrel girl and the unstoppable wasp fought each other, who would win? I know, that wasp character is pretty new. But they're unbeatable and unstoppable. Just saying. Maybe they should team up. So Bleeding Cool gets a copy of this magazine ahead of time. Don't know how. They're blaming someone internally at Marvel, but who knows. But the way they post everything is they write it down like, scoop! And they and because every single page of this magazine is another reveal, you know, 40-odd articles that said scoop, and then Marvel got mad. They're like, it's not a scoop. You're just leaking our information. It's not like you were given an exclusive. I can understand that. A lot of people at Marvel got really upset. And, and to be fair, I don't know what they had planned for Wednesday, if there was anything outside of this magazine. I'm thinking, okay, it's only 48 hours. It's not that big of a deal it's you know a dick move but it's not the end of the world but the way that the writers and editors responded to it i was reminded how much bleeding cool sucks they're saying like oh we did it for our readers some of our readers like to be spoiled like no we're, we're not in this for creator rights like, no you're in it for the clicks you're getting paid by advertisers for the number of times people click on your website and view your content this has nothing to do with readership this has nothing to do with creators this is all just selfish this is you trying to get uh No, they're just get click. They're scummy people. There isn't a person in this industry, I'm sure. We all know things that we could treat as exclusives, we could treat as news. Everyone has this at some point. But it's the choice of what's your integrity? Are you gonna be scum and selfish or are you gonna let people do things in their own way? I think people go into business like this to make money and this is how they make money, so they're gonna do what they need to do to make money. It's scummy to do. Yeah, it, the internet is such a double-edged sword, double -edged sword, and people can get so far ahead of things. And it's amazing that more things, more major things, aren't leaked and spoiled as they used to be. I remember when Harry Potter got leaked, the last Harry Potter book got leaked. And, you know, people that want to see it are going to see it, and those who want to wait, they'll find a way to wait the extra 12 or 24 hours. In all fairness, well, you really couldn't. They were like, we said that it was spoilers. Like, if you say the spoiler in the title, you're not really preventing spoilers. Yes, that's a good point. One of the things that came out this week, uh, before this and Bleeding Cool didn't get to spoil it, going to be a new Iron Man. Going to be a 15-year-old black girl named Riri. I had heard that, yes. Which seems to be part of Marvel's new thing. They're switching all of the old characters out, seems to be, for younger characters, probably so we can establish them, and then in 10 years, have them all star in movies. There we go. But right now, we have... Um, Wouldn't she be Iron Girl at that point? I don't know what her name is going to be. She's been in a couple of issues so far, but not as a very big character. But we're going to have teenaged black female Iron Man. Right now there's a South Korean Hulk. Oh, wow. Female Thor. Um, Do you think it's going to be kind of like a Terry McGinnis thing where like Batman trains him to be the new Batman? I mean, that's the way the Iron Man book is 
looking right now that Tony's going to be stepping aside and letting her do it and kind of training her. But I don't. There's been a whole shakeup of let's make the fact all I of our mentioned the name Terry McGinnis and you didn't blink. Like that's because I know you have friends who really like Batman. Damn it! I'm trying to impress you. <laughs> You're not getting that short, sweet kiss goodbye. <laughs> no. Sorry. Maybe a peck on the cheek yes. if you shave. I shaved yesterday. But I don't have to shave. Silky smooth. Except for the rest of your whole face. <laughs> Except for the beard part. So just a peck on the neck. Yes. Well, no, no, I didn't <laughs> agree to the... Damn it! <laughs> Son of a... But I don't know. If, if the book's written well, it's fine. I With comics, I never believe that anything ever really changes. The things are get introduced, but at some point, the status quo will return. Characters will come and go. It's all fine. If they want to try something different with Iron Man, great. Go do something different for a little bit. Or for a long bit. Do what you want. Hey, as long as it doesn't suck. Yeah, that's kind of the thing. I don't know. It's that kind of double-edged sword of you have characters who come in and establish characters like, well, okay, we're going to have this the mantle of this character be passed, and you have these legacy characters like, well, this one's going to be black or Asian, or this one's going to be gay, and then you have the argument of people going, well, why don't you establish new characters and just have their identities be something else? But the reality is, is these names have marquee value. People oh, yeah. know those names, so... I can understand both arguments. Oh, wait, what, the Unstoppable Wasp Girl coming out? Unsto- no, it's just the Wasp. Oh, the Unstoppable Wasp. But it's the uh, the Unbeatable Squirrel Girl. Yeah, she's a new... Don't yeah. forget Moon Girl and Devil Dinosaur. Not new characters. Oh. Uh, Ms. Marvel. Uncanny oh, yeah, there's movies. another one. Um, there's a Pakistani Miss Marvel now. But that'll do it for the news for this week. With that, we are going to get into this week's topic. We're going to be doing all four Next Generation movies. I love the Next Generation. I know you have a topic you can discuss. So sound smart. Time for a review. I'm the best there is at what I do. But what I do best isn't very nice. It's time for an Editor's Note podcast review. We haven't done a review in a little bit. It, yeah, this is not just one review. It's not just two reviews. It's not just three reviews. It is four reviews. Just four. Yeah, I know. <laughs> this is, there were only four Next Generation movies. Yeah. There was going to be a fifth, but... No, there wasn't. They, they, was, they were planning on doing a fifth, no, but... They, they advertised it as the final mission. Yeah, but there was... They had been in talks about it, but when Insurrection fell flat on its face... Because they wanted to have it be kind of an arc, almost a search for Spock kind of deal. Yeah. So going back, well, let's go back even further. I was going to go to 1994, but let's go further. Oh no, back no, go time. back to the beginning. Of what? The Next Generation. We don't need to review that. It's fine. The first two seasons suck, except for one episode. Oh come on. The rest is fine. Except... What? What's the best episode in the first season that you? In the best in the first season, nothing. The one that you said doesn't suck. Oh, that's in season two. Um, Measure of a Man. Measure of a yeah, but the big goodbye from season one got no- got nominated for um. Oh, an award. That's yeah. the first one that prominently featured the holodeck. It was the first first time we had Dixon Hill. Yeah, but late 80s television, what's your competition? Yeah, some of the early stuff, like the first season, eh. It was still trying to find its feet, where it wasn't... It, it, it was felt all like, miniskirts. Well, it felt a lot like the original series it, in some aspects, it, and they were trying to figure it out. But, I don't know, I don't hate... How'd you get introduced? Uh, well, growing up, we didn't have very many channels, and it was in syndication on ABC, and it was on in the afternoons. So I got home from school, and it was on, and I watched it, and I was hooked. Good characters, good stories, let your imagination run wild. My old man used to watch it. It was one of the few things he watched. They got a lot of things right. They inspired a lot of technology. Think about your tablets and cell phones. Yeah. But show ends. Great finale. Oh, fantastic finale. Of the best. That's Which was I... great because it was wrapped around great long-term storytelling, whether it was intentional or not, but to tie it back up in the same place it started in Q's courtroom. That was fantastic. That's great storytelling. So we have a, it's one of the best finales in television history. So they take a couple of months off. I don't even think they took a couple of months. I think they, just, they were filming concurrently. They, yeah. They, they, just filmed, went, they just wrapped on All Good Things, and they began filming immediately Generations. Uh, there was a bit of overlap, too. Same set, same everything. There's not really much in the way of upgrades. This comes out in 1994. And this is our transition movie. This is going, passing the torch from Star Trek VI into Star Trek Generations. We're not going to number things anymore. But this was also, like it was not passing the torch of the series so much as it was passing the, the movie torch. Because they still had, well, Undiscovered Country came out in 90, I want to say 93? It was still in the 90s, yeah. Whatever now I gotta, it was. Now I got IMDb it. 
because I like to be on point with this. But no, because Undiscovered Country, which is probably one of my favorite Star Trek, all of all the Star Trek movies, is one of my favorites. Surprisingly good. <laughs> Why is it surprisingly good? Because the series had taken such a downhill turn. What do you think? The what do you mean? The, like the movie series? Yeah. With, what? Because you didn't like? Because I didn't. You like, didn't like? I didn't like watching. You didn't like Final Frontier where they meet God? No, I don't God want to watch Starship. I don't want to watch that crap. I don't want to watch Shatner and his toupee. I don't want to watch everyone wearing their corsets. Suck in the guts. Undiscovered Country was 91, so there was three years in between movies. Movie opens up, and it's just a bottle spinning, and it goes on forever. You know, the first 20 minutes. The first 20 minutes. It's such a long 20 minutes. We have Kirk, Chekhov, and Scotty. You know, everyone's favorite characters. Except for Bones. Well, they tried to get, instead of having Scotty and Chekhov, it was supposed to be Spock and McCoy, but they wouldn't do it. I'm not sure if it was scheduling or what, but they tried and it didn't happen. Could have been. Could have been. Could have been fatigue, too. But DeForest Kelly was in the, uh, the, in pilot. the pilot of yeah. Next Generation. Which, by the way, how he hung in there. Bones? Because that takes place a hundred years. Oh, I thought you meant in real life. I'm like, no, he died. Oh, no, no, I know he died. <laughs> He's been but, dead like, a while. No, like, think about uh, it. It's supposed mean, to take place a hundred years after the Enterpr- after Yeah, yeah, yeah you, you mean fictional character, yes. The fictional character survived a long time. Well, I mean, he was a doctor. Advances in medicine. I was told he was a doctor many times. Damn it, Jim, I'm a doctor, not an elevator. You know who else hangs it? Well, Spock, I mean, he's Vulcan. He doesn't really ever age. Nope. When you think about it, of those main characters, like, of the big three, right? Bones, McCoy, uh, Bones, Spock, and Kirk, the only one who didn't appear in the next generation was Kirk. Yep. Because you had an episode with Scotty, Relics, yep. where he was inside the Dyson Sphere. Well, he was actually that, in that transporter, transporter stasis. loop. For yeah, her, whatever. It's a cool novelty at first. It's like, oh, it's look at those characters. But then it's after twenty minutes, it's like, she's end. But it's the Enterprise B. Yeah, with um the kid from Ferris Bueller's Day Off. Yeah, he was also on um Spin City. Spin City. Yeah, and playing Captain John Harriman. Nothing else. Oh my god! But it went on and on and on. Wasn't one of the guys that was on Voyager? He was he was one of the yeah helmsmen. Yeah, he was. And there's um I don't know the guy's name. I'm not gonna look him up. But there, yeah. you, if you go back and watch that scene, there's a lot of character actors who are still pretty prominent today who were like really young in that scene. Yes, well, I mean that was, was seen in those twelve first... years ago. No, twenty two years ago. Holy cow! Good math. Thank you. And then Kirk thankfully dies. No. No, he doesn't. I wish he did. Movie twist. But we get the energy ribbon, the Nexus, right? So the B, the Enterprise B is out on this rescue mission. We meet Guinan for the first time in the movie, but we've known her forever. Yeah, for the first time eight years later. Yes. I like it. I I didn't hate it because you got to have it establishes that bit of nostalgia. But then that's the last we see of everybody but Kirk till later. Yeah. Fast forward 100 years, or 80 some odd years later, whatever it said on the... I'm going to just give a quick summary of the plot. We don't need to go through this movie scene for scene. The quick gist is Malcolm McDowell, he's in the past. They're in this space ribbon that makes everyone happy. The Nexus. They take him out of it, and he spends the rest of his life wanting to get back to it. And then... Willing to like destroy stars. And yeah, and then Picard up with has the... to stop him so he doesn't yeah. blow up a planet. Well, he, he teams up with the Dura sisters. The big thing that you can pull away, two, three big things here. Kirk dies, dies, which I always wonder why they leave his body on Verity in three. Also, Data gets the emotion chip. Yeah. Which is a big uh, thing. How do you really feel about the emotion chip? I dislike it. It's part of Data's quest to become more human. Yeah, there are better ways to go about that. So I'm going to ask He you. is fully functional and uh, programmed in multiple techniques. Uh, there's an annoying trend with all these movies. Star Trek, the people who did this, who did the TV show, continued the movies. That's a little bit of a problem. Rick Berman was producer on, most, on all of the movies, I believe. Yeah, but the problem with that is these people know how to do episodic television. They know how to do episodic television really well. But most of those meant that, okay, this episode's a Riker episode, this episode's a Crusher episode, this is a Picard episode, that kind of stuff. They don't know how, even though this is an ensemble cast, they don't know how to handle an ensemble at all. I think one thing that you miss, though, and I think you, if you really pay attention, you can pick up on it, is the parallels in all of the movies between Picard and Data. Look at the parallels in this movie. Picard dealing with the emotion 
And Picard is like, <laughs> I like Patrick Stewart, but he had he really hammed it up in this. My God, you let me finish my point. All right, look in in three of the four movies, the plot lines for Picard and Data are parallel, dealing with emotions in the face of duty. In the second one, the Borg, they're both being assimilated again. Data's been down the same road as Picard. And in Nemesis, they're both looking at shadows and echoes of themselves with B4 and with Shinzon. And then Picard and Data are so... Picard is finding out how he was also a flotation device? No. Oh, okay. No, Picard is not a flotation device. Oh. But no, like I said, the, the three big things that we get, Kirk is dead. That's really the passing of the torch. It's the last time we see minus Spock, an original series character in one of the newer movies, but you don't see any other original series character in the Next Generation movies. Data gets the emotion chip, which plays a key role in the next movie, and then after that, it's really nothing. But the Enterprise gets friggin' destroyed. That's a really cool scene. So, act surprised, Jordy, being the April O'Neil of this series, gets kidnapped. <laughs> Did you watch the, the YouTube clip I told you to watch of Jordy gets owned? Yeah. Isn't it not hilarious? Oh, yeah. But Jordy gets kidnapped and... Um, because Data is hiding behind a photon torpedo. Yeah, let's, let's do the good part. Because there are good parts of this movie. Why in the world was Soren firing off a particle weapon around all those photon torpedoes? You mean a butane torch with some stuff added onto the side? That shot out... It was a disruptor. Did you, it's just a butane torch. I know what it is. <laughs> just like a lightsaber is a grip handle. <laughs> so bad. Jordy gets captured, Klingons are able to use his visor to figure out how to blow up the Enterprise. And I love that crash. The Enterprise crashes. It's the second Enterprise we've seen destroyed. It's all done with miniatures, though. It looks really good. Oh, it was a fantastic sequence. Done by ILM. But no, well, I mean, they don't figure out how to blow up the Enterprise. They figure out the the shield modulation, the phase modulation, so they're able to adjust to the disruptors and photon torpedoes, causing a warp core breach. They have to separate the saucer section, and then it blows up. But not before... Not before they figure out how to uncloak the, um, or cause the Klingon Warbird to cloak, dropping its shields, and then just, here's the other thing that gets me. The Enterprise, and all Federation ships, take a barrage of photon torpedoes. Everybody else in the galaxy, one photon torpedo destroys their ship. One! Well, they don't have a galaxy-class starship. That's a good point. I love that scene, though, when they get the, the ship to cloak, and Riker's just like, fire. And then Worf just, beep, and then it's over. Oh yeah, poor Worf in the beginning of this movie finally gets a promotion. Everyone else has been a lieutenant commander or higher. Yes. This entire series run and finally like, Worf can have a promotion now. I love the scene on the ship, though, when they're on the old sailing vessel. Yeah, don't think about the holodeck too much. I can understand. Okay, you can project things. How do you project water? How do you make water a thing? They're able to think about the food replicators making food and matter out of pure energy. Just remember in First Contact, Picard says without safety without safety guards, a holographic bullet can kill. Yeah, that doesn't make any sense either. Dude, suspension of disbelief. It's the friggin' 24th century. It's like 300 years from now. Yeah. Anything could happen. But it's not the first time we've seen people get wet in the holodeck. Oh no, that was the Arboretum. I'm not saying it makes any sense. It happens, it just doesn't make sense. Yes. Just don't think about the holodeck too much. As I'm going to ask with each of these movies, what was Data's subplot? Oh, data subplot was his emotions, the emotion chip, dealing with becoming more human. Because, is it, I can't remember if it was Crusher or Troy. I think it was Troy. He pushes oh. Troy in the water. No, he pushes Crusher in the water. Okay. He pushes Crusher in the water, and... No one thinks it's no funny. No one thinks it's funny. Although everyone thought it was hilarious when Riker drops Worf in the pond. Yeah, and all, in Data's defense, the hell. Yeah, exactly. Hey, he just did it, and everyone... It's like this, It's like getting caught, like, like you know, you do something wrong... And then your brother or sister does it to you, and they get caught and they get in trouble. That's kind of what that is. I think also it was like, it was Worf's moment. Riker, I like Riker. He's probably my, I'm torn between Riker and Picard being my favorite characters on the series. But so what happens with Data? Because it's, oh my god, it's the worst. Oh, so yeah, he pushes Crusher in the in the water, knocking Worf back in. Poor Worf. Dude, this is his day. It's his party. And he's getting dropped in the ocean twice. So he, he just finds himself more at conflict with trying to become more human, which is his story arc from the very beginning. Yeah, and we did the emotion ship in the series already. It wasn't an emotion ship. It was Lore having emotions and was able to, like, you know, Wi-Fi it to Data. Well, no, because he took the emotion ship. 
Yeah, at the and, end. And Laura, no, Laura took the emotion chip, but his, um, he was never meant to process it. Yeah. But he did uh-huh. a weird thing where he flipped up his fingernail and, like, turned it up to give Data some yeah. emotions. He also had emotions one time from Q when they uh, saved Q and got him back in the continuum. That's also when he brought the mariachi band in, gave Worf a couple of hot girls. Oh, yeah. Look, Data Cigars works... for everyone. Data works best being minimal. Him not emoting is what makes the character interesting. Because he doesn't understand. Remember the whole the episode where he was dating somebody on the Enterprise? And he writes a whole program like, honey, I'm home. Yeah. And like they kiss, and she asks... What were you thinking of just now? And he lists off like a million different things. And then her, is, and she's like, glad I was in there somewhere. That's a deep cut. That's but a well-written woman right there. Data gets his emotion ship. And then Data becomes the most insufferable part of this movie. Not only does he become insufferable, he just becomes like hard to watch. Although there are some funny things. No, I there do- aren't. Oh, come on. I think it's funny when, as the sausage section drops into the planet and Data's like, oh, shit. Come on, that was funny. No, it's well, the worst. No, I think it's funny. Uh, I hate it. Then he gets his emotion trip. He goes, he takes a drink, and he was like, ugh, I hate this. <laughs> it's like the scene in... Um, how how do emotions equal It's like the scene buds? in Relics, when he gives Scotty the drink, and Scotty's like, what is it? And he's like, it is green. <laughs> I mean, Data sings, he gets sad and Light whiny. forms. Those tiny little lights. Forms. I'm gonna hit you with a brick. Where are you? Are you yes. gonna let that ruin the whole movie for you? The whole movie ruins it for me. Malcolm McDowell's character, who I don't remember the name of. Soren. Soren, there you Soren's, go. Yeah. He's down on this planet and he's gonna blow in three. Yep. His plan is to blow up a star so he can go back into the Nexus and be happy. Yes. And Picard gets down there, they have the second worst fight in this movie. It's a real half-assed fight, but you've got to get Picard into the Nexus. Yep, Picard gets sucked up. He has a moment of happiness. He has his unreasonably young children for a man his age. But it's a different lifetime. Like we can't like um, like you can't project Picard going younger. It's him as himself now, but it's projected back in time. Father, I love my Victorian era Dolly in the twenty-fourth century. No, shut up, kid. You don't know that Picard can do that. I guess he his happy version of the world is having Victorian a, England, having a family for that French having man, a, having a kick-ass looking Christmas dinner on the table. <laughs> he has a tree. He has a tree. Uh, but then Picard figures out that hey, if I have any wish, it's to go back in time to stop Soren from killing a bunch of people. Let's well, like just plan it. Yeah, but also Picard doesn't realize that the Enterprise is effed up. Yeah, like. They're all dead. Yeah, anytime that Riker's left in charge of the Enterprise. Well, let's be real. The real problem here is this was Troy's first time flying the ship. And women drivers, she crashes oh, that thing no. immediately. You told me you've been waiting on this <laughs> joke know. all week. <laughs> like, women drivers? <laughs> no, because remember, Beverly took control of the saucer section once. Good point, because in a fourth in the fourth movie, she also crashes the ship. Yeah, she's so... Stop it. But that was on Picard's orders. <laughs> On his text message. <laughs> yes, we're not there yet. <laughs> so Picard was like, I need to go back in time and stop this. And he finds Guinan in there. It's not really explained. Don't worry about it. Yeah, how did Guinan yeah, no, like, show up? Like, there's a part of me left behind. Don't let's. We're just going to gloss over this. So he's like, I'm going to go back and stop Storin. And she's like, well, how will things be different? He's like, I don't know. If I mess up again, I guess I can just do this exact same thing over and over again. Yes. <laughs> like uh, just being this, you know, it's like hitting the reset button. Oh, screwed up on the boss. I'll try it a different way. Yeah, which is really what the resolution towards the end of this movie should have been. He's yes. dead. Back to the Nexus. We'll try again. <laughs> Back to the Nexus. Let's just hang out in the Nexus for a while. But then it turns out that <gasps> James T. Kirk is there too. And in his mind, he just showed up too. That doesn't make sense, right? That's weird. No, zero sense. Unless she's like directing him to go to the time, like the moment where Kirk ends up in the Nexus, which is possible. Yeah, but oh my! So we have the two biggest titans of this series together for the first time. What do they do together? They make breakfast. Well, they chop some wood. They chop some wood. They make some breakfast. Picard has to get some dill. Some dill. And then they ride a horse. Yes. What the hell? This is the first time these characters have been together. This should be epic. And this is the two of them doing mundane chores together. Yes. Well, I mean, it's awful. But it also is... And boring. you got to look at what Kirk... Like, Kirk's 
even though he's not in the movie very long, really, he's got it's the same storyline with Kirk. Where does Kirk always want to be? No matter where he's put or where he's taken or what he does, where does he want to be? Enterprise. Yeah. Not just on the Enterprise, but the center chair. Uh, he just wants... The chair is his unicorn. All right? Although he catches the chair because he's in the chair a lot. But, like, he so just wants... a unicorn? To... Yeah. A mythical creature, hard, impossible to catch. Like, you're always chasing it. You're missing, the like, the subplot point here, which I know you think it doesn't handle it well, and it could because it doesn't really explore it. Inside the Nexus, it's both captains' regrets. I'm watching a fat man eat eggs. Dude, you're missing the Lower point. Lower your cholesterol, You're missing sir. the point. It's both of their regrets. Picard regrets that he doesn't, he loses his family. Doesn't have it. Kirk never has a family because he's so bound and he had a family. He banged that chick and then Christopher Leak or not Christopher Leak, Christopher Lloyd killed his kid. Antonia, he had Antonia waiting upstairs in bed. He's gonna make her some breakfast. Say this is you know I'm going back to Starfleet, but now he has a chance to do it right. And it just it reaffirms their commitment to what they do. It's what makes they are the captain. It's their life. And but the Nexus helps amplify their regret and it helps direct them back in the direction they need to go. Could it have been a little more exciting? Sure. But still In any way it could have been more exciting. He was out saving the galaxy while Picard's grandfather was in diapers, man. Show him some damn respect. Oh my god, that fat J T Kirk deserve it. Listen, I like Picard better than Kirk. Gonna get a lot of irrational hate for that. I do like it when you get random Twitters. But random Twitters? How old am I? Old enough to know that it's not random in Twitters. <laughs> At least 80. So Kirk and Spock go back together. And they're going to go and they're going to fight Sauron. Sauron? Sauron? Malcolm McDowell? Yeah. Not Sauron. <laughs> it's Sauron. This scene. So I also love that Picard's like, I'm going to go back to the perfect moment to do this. And he goes back to the moment when he's trapped under a pile of rocks. Yes. <laughs> why? Any other time. Go five seconds before or after. Yeah, why, and why don't you project yourself on the launcher platform? Like, I know there's a lot of different ways to go about it. Don't go under the rocks. But then we get one of the worst fights ever. It's just a bunch of old men slowly jogging and slowly punching. You know what Lion Picard uses a lot in the movies? Captain's prerogative. Saying engage. Oh, no, that's that's cool. The Picard maneuver. Make it this so. scene has a lot of epic music, but if you were to take the music away, it's just a couple of old men slowly jogging and carefully stepping over rocks. See, you're like you're getting real nitpicky. No, you know, nitpicky. This see... is the, this is the climax of a movie. This is the death of a timeless character. This should be momentous, and this is a wet fart. Did, oh come on! Did you know that Kirk was wrong though? He said that he was always he always knew he was gonna die alone. But when you think about it, did he like? Because everyone else he knows is dead. <sighs> it's so bad. And the, Kirk falls off a bridge and dies. Well, he falls off. He falls down with a bridge. He doesn't really fall off the bridge. The bridge falls on him, pushing forward. <laughs> and then it was fun. Full Shatner. He's gone full Shatner. It was fun. Did we make a difference? Uh, but Kirk's last words of oh my and then gently resting his head oh the rock's hard man don't want to you know don't want to duff that hairpiece off I can only move so fast at any given time but why does Picard leave Kirk on the planet like why does he bury him on the planet he's like oh no one's gonna believe me that James Kirk was here you got the friggin body right there you know beam it up to the Farragut with you guys as you're leaving give him a proper burial on earth take him back to or just go back into the Nexus and not have him die at that point, it's, you know, little column A, little column B. You can't, like... Because what's Kirk going to do? Take over the Enterprise again? Because that's what he does. That's what he does. Oh, in the my, other... Yeah, God forbid anyone else in the universe be intelligent other than James T. Kirk. Or command the Enterprise. Yeah. Jeez. Oh, how cool would it have been to, like, have Kirk get on the Enterprise and see how, like, badass... They... Well, too bad that Troy broke it, but still. <laughs> yeah. Women drivers. All right. So, uh, using the patent rating system, because we have three more movies to crank through here. Yeah. See it in theaters, red box it, or do something better. This one, I'm giving it a skip. Just oh, skip this no, one. No, I'd go back and if I could see it in theaters again, I would. This, this do you own Jenner? You do. We're going to watch it. I just watched it for this show. I'm not watching it again. You didn't invite me over to watch it, a-hole. I, you, we watched Nemesis. We did. 
But I like Generations. <sighs> no, it doesn't do it for me. Moving on. 1994. We now move on to 1996. It's been two years. Best of the Star Trek. Best of the Next Generation movies. Yep. We've moved on to First Contact. This movie is directed by Jonathan Frakes, main resident, and Commander Riker. The continuing theme of these movies, too, are the cast didn't really appreciate an outside director. We get that when we get to Nemesis and Stuart Baird. They didn't like it. In fact, Marina Soteris has gone as far to call him as an idiot in the director of Nemesis. But let's stick with First Contact. So we get, we get an in-house guy, a guy who knows the canon, knows the product, directing it. Yeah, these movies are also not accessible. If you haven't watched Star Trek before... You can't go into these movies. These are not accessible movies. No, you gotta know. You gotta know a little bit. That's not a good thing. That's a bad thing. Yeah, but you've got the target audience. You're gonna get the people you need to get. These all, the, all these movies profited, which is hey, why they had no budget. But we do have a new ship because you know women drivers destroyed the last one, the Enterprise E. We have moved on. What do you think of the new design? I like it. It's, it's too flat. It follows the way that the ships are going. I mean, look at Voyager. Voyager was a similar looking ship. Yeah, that doesn't mean I. But it's the new, it's the new flagship. That I like it. So I'm um, again do a quick summary of the plot just so we can talk about the other stuff. The Borg go back in time to stop first contact with an alien race so they can assimilate all of Earth and don't have to deal with the Federation's yeah. crap later on. Post World War Three. Which, right. by the way, first contact according to the movies is like only four years away. It's like 2063. You know, after Trump's America, we just might have that war. Well, you got to have World War Three in the well, post-atomic horror. No, we're not doing that. But we meet Zephram Cochran, who is like the man. Oh my god, he sucks. You don't like Zephram Cochran in this movie? No, what's, what's that actor's name? James Cromwell. James Cromwell, who's also an episode of The Next Generation. Two episodes. This is his yes. third Next Generation character. So, what was Data's subplot in this one? Again, it has to deal with becoming human because he gets captured by the Borg, and the Borg Queen offers him a chance to have real skin and feelings and be one of them. So, not one of them, because. Data's subplot always has been, since the first episode, since Encounter at Farpoint, is to become more human. We always get the Data becoming more human. Yeah, but in every movie it sucks. Because it, it just, it, it is, alright? Data's one of the best characters on the show, but I hate him in all these movies. I like him in this movie. <sighs> I like Data. Yeah. Because he gets so sad. Why? Because you think he should, he should, not, he should not be able to emote? Yes. I don't think the actor emotes all that well. Brent Spiner's a fantastic actor. What don't you like about Brent Spiner? It's all too over the top when he's not cutting... When he's not taking away emotion, when he's not being what Data should be. It's all so over the top. Did you know that um, Brent Spiner recorded an album, and a cut on that album was um, recorded with a group called The Sunspots? It's called It's a Sin to Tell a Lie. And the guys who sang with him as a quartet, Patrick Stewart, Jonathan Frakes... And Michael Dorn. Sounds terrible. I never want to hear that. Did you ever listen to Leonard Nimoy's album? Where he's like singing the praises of like Bilbo, Bilbo, or... Bilbo Baggins. Like, shut up, That's Leonard not the, Nimoy. the tune, but yeah, I, I get what you're saying. <laughs> I know. I have no idea what that, that tune was. A, that was a hit song. That charted, dude. Oh, God. That's vomit inducing. I'm going to Google Leonard Nimoy, Bilbo Baggins, and see where it. Because I think it was like, it like reached the charts. This movie, this is. I think generally considered to be the best of the next generation movies, and I agree. It's certainly more cinematic than Generations was. We have a really good space battle in the beginning. Oh, yes, the Battle of Sector 001, which they told the Enterprise, like, you can't go to this fight because your captain would produce it and, you know, be adding a volatile element into an unstable situation. Because in the TV series, Picard had been assimilated by the Borg, what was that, season three? Season three into season four. Four. Yeah, the summer cliffhanger that they started doing then. Yes, uh, that was, um, was super annoying. They were actually getting close to actually killing him off because they were hung up on his contract negotiations. They were going to kill Picard. We were watching the Blu-ray special features. That's like, he didn't realize how popular the show was until like people would like drive up to him, just, like in his car in LA, and people drove up next to him like, "You ruined our summer!" Wow, and drove off. That's terrible. <laughs> And they said when they wrote that, they didn't know how they were actually going to pick up. The, the guy who did it just wrote the ending and thought he was leaving the show, so he was like, yeah, the next guy will figure it out. Yeah. And then it was him again. Because it was, yeah, I think it was season three, because they finally had... A good season? Well, that, and they had the new, un like, the uniforms that didn't have the red piping down. They were the actual... They looked better. They had the collar on them. But the board costumes looked awful. The movie costumes looked yes. good. Yes. Board yeah. movie costumes. So, yeah, the Federation doesn't want the Enterprise to go fight the Borg, but we do get a really good space battle. But here we run into something interesting with the rest of the Next Generation movies. 
Worf being an insanely popular character, spun off into Deep Space Nine. Deep Space Nine is still happening at this point, so the movies have to keep on constructing reasons for Worf to be there, which sometimes are good and sometimes are not good. We'll get into that in the this next one. This is ones. good. He's there with the Defiant. The Defiant's going to be there fighting the battle. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, so the Defiant's there, and he's like, Prepare for ramming speed! Perhaps today is a good day to die. I love Worf. Worf's awesome. Can we we should hashtag uh, we want Worf, see if we get Michael Dorn to listen to our podcast. No, that show ain't happening. No, but I mean we can still see if we can get Michael Dorn to listen to our podcast. I don't think he will. Maybe we get a Worf shirt. I was there for all of this. I don't need to hear you summarize it. I like Worf. I do like Worf. Worf's good. He's got that deep the deep voice that he talks with, just I don't know. I'm a I'm a Worf guy. I'm a Worf fan. I can't think of a character on the show I really don't like. I didn't like the Doctor in season two. I was going to say any Doctor on that show. You don't like Beverly Crusher? Not particularly. Oh, dude. I thought, I mean, not as hot as Troy, but she still had some, like, hot mom qualities. You have issues. You have weird issues. No, obviously. I think you're, you're, I'm a Troy. I like Troy. Troy's. I thought you were going to say something about my mother. I have nothing to say about your mother other than that she's a nice woman. Yeah. So something new is introduced for the Borg. The Borg Queen. What do you think about that? It kind of. The Borg is a collective, and I get that. And I like they're, but they still have to have like the queen bee. The like a hive of bees is a collective. Beyonce's there. Beyonce was the Borg queen. Look out! <laughs> Most powerful woman in America. She can assimilate. Who is Becky with the good hair? She can assimilate me anytime she wants. What did Jay Z do that? Let's let's get real here. Do you think Jay Z? What do you, are you asking me? If Lemonade is directed at Jay Z? Yeah, probably. I would think is a good you know chance. Yeah, no, he definitely did. <laughs> yes. Well, God, this is the nerdiest show we've done. Because that's, I'm right on pace with you. I'm not hanging along. I'm not inept in this one. I'm not clueless. You're not Alicia Silverstone in 1995? Ooh, good one. Good one. Is that 95? I'm not looking it up. I'm right. I also never saw that movie. I love, <sighs> I love, love, love the Zero-G battle. We got our red shirt killed, Lieutenant Hawk. Yeah, which but, is, what's that actor's name? He's in a ton of stuff now. Oh, he was in uh, Walking Tall. He was Dum Dum Dugan in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Yes. He was in Arrow, which I don't watch. Oh, what the hell is his name? Good actor. I like him. But I love... Uh, a Norm something? I'm not going to look no. it up. Whatever. I but care. I love the scope. Because we never really ever get the scope of how big these starships are when they're walking across the hull of the Enterprise and it zooms out and they are just so tiny. That gives you, like, tremendous scope, finally. Because, like, they can say, oh, it's however many meters long, like, you know, or wide or tall and all these decks. But when you see them walking on the hull of the Enterprise, that's pretty badass. Yeah. Some of the wire work is a little weak. You're really scrounging the bottom of the barrel for, you know, finding things to dislike about this. I don't dislike this movie. I like this movie. This is a good one. And like I said, it doesn't work for a new audience. It works as a sequel to a two-part episode from years before. It can't be a sequel. Too much time has passed. I wouldn't call it a sequel. I mean, in the same way, I consider the 2009 Star Trek to be a sequel. Uh, I don't remember the name of the episode. The two-parter with Spock. Oh, um, Reunification. Yeah, that the 2009 Star Trek is more of a sequel to that than anything else. Well, because it's a tie into the the book you're having me read right now. Yeah, because that next week. Yes. Oh yeah, I'm I'm excited to read. I'm not going to speed read this. I may even enjoy a craft beer. I'm not going to go Jerry Six on this old school. <laughs> I am not going. To, I'm going full on Jerry Twelve. Jeez. Maybe even get to Jerry 13, because I love Star <laughs> Trek that much. Take that, old school Ross. Hashtag Twitter best friends. <laughs> You've created so many nemesis on the show. Nemesis? How do you, can you plural that? I don't know. Old school Ross is not a nemesis. I like him. I, he keeps me in check. <laughs> yell cause see, he, I feel we, like I bring joy into his life, because every week he can listen to the podcast and realize that he's better than me. <laughs> we're, he's not. He's like he's not a total loser, because he's not me. <laughs> we were in a hotel over the weekend, and I just remember yelling at you from the bathroom. Ha! You check your Twitter, and I never said, "Yep, Jerry <laughs> Six checking in." Uh, Jared uh, was being Twitterly assaulted over yeah, the well, weekend. If you follow me on at Junior Rich. You'll see. Plug away at Old School Ross tweeted at me for speed reading <laughs> Jerry Six. Jerry Six speed reading Watchmen while drinking Bud Light instead of enjoying it with a fine main craft brew. Well, I'm going to enjoy the Star Trek book with a fine main craft brew. Which is nowhere near as deep as Watchmen. No, but it's more in my... I like it. I already like it. I've started to read it. I'm going to take my time with it. It's more your speed. It's more my speed. I'm not going to speed through it. 
It is what it is. But the next generation crew, they go to what is our future, which is like what? 2063. Yeah, 60 something. 2063, And they have those weird, generic, nondescript future clothes. Yeah, well, I mean, it's the post atomic horror. They're kind of, you know. But we do get one thing that I like for the movie series. So, like I said, in Generations, Jordy gets kidnapped and they mess with his visor so they can blow up the Enterprise. They do do a lot of show don't tell kind of stuff. So Jordy has his visor compromised. This was the thing they brought up occasionally in the series. Like, why don't you just get implants? Yeah, he's like, why do I need to? But he does get an upgrade because, in the way I always interpreted it, because he was compromised in the last movie. Oh, yeah. So we get a, what do you think about the Jordy upgrade? I think it's cool. I think it's really cool. I also think it's probably a lot easier for LeVar Burton to act with contacts Instead on. Instead of lurk, looking through um, an a, air filter for like a 1967 no, Chevy Cordova. It was a headband. Oh, yeah. It was like a barrette, yeah. Yeah, and they just put it over. That's going to be really hard to act in. But I thought the advisor was cool technology for that, but I like... I like the upgrade for the movie. I like the upgrade. And um, I like that we get some Jordy vision. Not as cool as Predator vision. No, because I like it. And we get to see him use it, because when he's looking across the field to find Cochran. But it's cool. Like With with his mind, he can like switch from infrared to regular. So, I mean, also, it's got to be really weird for Jordy, because he's only seen, like, resonance imaging he isn't really like with the visor it doesn't like produce like pictures i like having a distinction i mean i like in this movie as much as the old chip is nice you have easy example i would say is going from firefly to serenity technically the same ship but there's it's clearly not the same set clearly not the same ship technically but in this i like that we have a logical explanation for the ship being totally different which being women drivers uh, <laughs> well, I was just thinking, by the way, I wasn't like spacing out. I was also thinking of other times. Jordy also, in All Good Things, has regular eyesight because of the space anomaly. It reverts his eyes to healing themselves. But also, future Jordy in All Good Things had implants as well. It was only past Jordy that had the visor. And that mustache. I do like in All Good Things how they have Worf bring back like the gold sash and they bring back Tasha Yar. We're not talking about that because. I'm just reminiscing. Well, although, that was really good. If the series ended there, that would have been fine. Well, it did end there. <laughs> you know what I mean. But no, I like the change of the Enterprise E. The bridge is a little. The bridge feels more like the battle bridge from the Enterprise D. And they threaten to blow up the ship again. The Enterprise is always in danger of getting blown up. They're always willing to blow it up, and it never happens. Is there anything else important that happens in this movie? Uh, the Borg are eradicated. What did you think of um, Ellie, Cochrane's friend? Oh, God. Gets on the, on She's the Enterprise. friggin' annoying. I don't like the two new characters we get. I don't like Cochran. I don't like her. What do you like about Cochran? It's such a great exploration of like everyone that you think like is like famous. Because he's just from, like, so cheesy, and he's like, I'm I'm a drunken genius, and I really like listening to Steppenwolf, and you guys are on some kind of Star Trek. See, that was a Shut funny up. line. That no, was a wasn't. funny line. But it, I think it's a really good exploration of like. Think about heroes from your past that you adore. It's, are they really the people that you think that they are? I thought it was a great exploration. Oh, you're like Cochran, you know, you're standing right here with the statue is, and you're looking to the stars, and you know, don't be a great man, just be a man. All these things about Cochran and drunk and Deanna Troy, which they didn't, that was funny. No, I'm just trying to blend in with the people. You're like, blended all right. This is now time to talk about time. We don't have the time. Oh my, shut up! Oh, I hate you so on. much. Oh, why do you hate Troy? I think it's great, because they have Synthahol. These guys don't know how to hold their liquor. It's great! I was at a New York Comic Con in 2009. She had a booth. No one was over there. It was sad. Oh, I'd, I'd go to her booth. No one else did. Well, well are you going to take me to a, a comic? Are you going to take me to a con? Look, I get one other ticket and it ain't for you. Oh. I need a booth, buddy, so I can pee. Oh. I could be your booth buddy. Or in, in November, I really need a booth buddy so I can go get Stanley's autograph. I could be your booth buddy. No, I no, you're not coming with me. Oh. Stanley's doing his last round of cons. Oh. Which one are you going to in November? He's 94. Life well lived. Good job, Stan. Yeah, 94. No, but this is on. Gene Roddenberry's night on our show. No, I'm going to um in November. I'm working the Rhode Island con, and that's his last New England appearance. Oh. And you see that page on the wall right in front of you? I do, but the people can't. Yeah, the, uh, well, I can explain it. Okay. That was um, that came out in 2007. That was the last Fantastic Four issue Stanley ever did. Fantastic Four being the book that started the Marvel Age of Comics, being ah. Fantastic Four number one. So I'm going to have Stan sign a page from his last go at the series. So you're going to take that page and have it signed? Yeah, and I already bought my ticket for it, which 
was more than I would. So you're gonna increase the value of that page exponentially. I'm never gonna sell it. That's the thing. Like, but I no, have, like I know you're not gonna sell your art. I've had people like ask art. me like if they can buy my art. I'm like, no. You've invested <laughs> a lot of your money in the art. I don't want to talk about how much money has gone into the art. No. Yeah, that's that's what that is. That was um oh, that cool. page is purchased for the intent of Stan signing it. That's got ninety four. Ninety four. Good on him. Anyway. Back to 96, his first contact. <laughs> yeah, okay, there we go. I like the exploration of, like, it's kind of like Back to the Future. It's like, if you go back in time, what were your parents like? If you go back and meet your heroes, what were they really like? I don't know. I'm going to meet Stan Lee in November. Jeez. Yeah, but, I mean, still, you think about the whole Cochran thing. He was doing it for the money, and but time changes him, and it changes people's perspective of him. I think it was a really neat character exploration. I think that you're, you're too caught up. And I don't know, but it's not pleasant. Uh, as much as I like this movie, and I do, I still have to look at the view that none of these necessarily are good movies. The good Star Trek movies, good for people who know the series, good for fans, but not necessarily good movies. So this is where I take the Roger Ebert stance, okay? When you go to certain types of movies, you go for what kind of movie they are. You're not always going for a grand cinematic experience. So when you go to an Indiana Jones movie, you're expecting to see him travel the world, use the bullwhip, have the girl, save the day at the end, make stuff up as he goes along, explosions, crazy, weird, supernatural things. You're not going for huge development of character. You're not going for a grand story. You're going for the action and adventure. So when I go to a Star Trek movie... But that's still accessible to... New audiences. You could walk into any Indiana Jones movie and maybe not hate it. Okay, but here's half the time. Here's my point. I'd say 75% of the time you can go into an Indiana Jones movie, Indiana Jones movie and not hate it. Future episode. But when you go to a Star Trek movie, A, you're probably a Star Trek fan. Although, granted, the new movies are a little more accessible because it's a reboot yeah. of everything. Okay? But when you go to a Star Trek movie, you're going... Especially the Next Generation movies. You're going because you love the Next Generation cast and crew. You love what's going on. You love the characters. You And it's a story. You know you're going to get a story that you're going to enjoy. Except for when it comes to the Sona and the Baku. But that's different. Before you're going to get there. Um, that's my least favorite of the Star Trek movies. Overall, I like getting a little bit deeper. And, and I always enjoy the character study. But we get it into Picard and his mentality. This is probably the most unhinged we ever see him. Yes, like it's the first time like we don't. Cause, I mean, the well, except for his, the time that he was tortured, he wasn't really unhinged in that. He was tortured. There are four lights. Yes, there are four lights. But you saw five. Yeah, damn, that's a good episode. Oh, like, what a, a great really, two-parter really good episode. Oh, what one was that? That was um. Oh no no, chain of command. It was a two-part episode in the middle of the sixth season. Great episodes. Picard gets tortured. Either way, this is where we can see Picard fall apart a bit. Oh, yeah, um, where he's like, he wants revenge. He wants this. The line must be drawn here. No further. There is a bit Captain of Captain Ahab has to go hunt his whale. There is some hamming it up in this movie. I like that line. The line must be drawn here. I like, I don't know, I like it because we see Picard lose it. And Picard is such a, like, he's always got it together. But, no, I like the character exploration. I think Jonathan Frakes directing it had a lot to do with helping get us back to a familiar flow. Because, I mean, I agree with a lot of people. Generations does feel like a two-part episode, where this doesn't feel like a two-part episode. It handles both. It's cinematic. It, ha- it handles multiple storylines well, because you've got everything that's happening on Earth. You come at it from, like, a film background, an English degree, and, like, multiple-layered storytelling. I'm coming at it from a fan's perspective. It's not going to handle multiple storylines like the Lord of the Rings trilogy handles multiple storylines. You can't go in there expecting that. Overall, this is my favorite Next Generation movie. I would, oh, yeah. On our rating system, I would say see it in theaters. Oh, absolutely. See it in theaters again. Did you see it in theaters? Oh, absolutely. Oh, I didn't. You didn't? No, I didn't oh, see you it lost in out. theaters. I'm going to get a high-definition projector and a sheet and some speakers, and we'll do that. The next the next two I saw in theaters, but no, this was... I didn't see Insurrection in theaters. No, I, wait, I did. I saw all four in theaters. There's something else I didn't see in theaters. Yeah, I saw... No, um, I mean, 96, what was I, 8? Yeah, I was I didn't see that in the theaters. Well, if I ever wanted to go see a movie in theaters, my parents had like this like three week rule, like we don't want to be around people ever because of you, like taking you out in public and having to display. No, that they you... just don't like being in theaters. Oh, look, it's it's the Bowens and their freak child Zach. 
So fast forward two years, we get to 1998. What was your rating? Oh, I said see it in theaters. Did you? I, Absolutely. I oh boy, now we move on to Insurrection. Oh. Yeah, welcome to my world of crap. <laughs> Let's, yeah, stay positive here. Let's see that. This movie. Oh my god. This is the worst. But what's weird is Frakes directed it again. Yeah, Jonathan Frakes directed it. Patrick Stewart, who had directed some episodes of the series, he pro- he was one of the producers on it. I think they were handcuffed by a really, really bad script. Oh, this is a really, really, really bad script. This because this movie. is like prime. Di- Picard lives and dies by the prime directive, and this is like they are just shitting all over the prime directive in this movie. This movie makes no sense. This movie, I don't know how else to say it. It has no sense. It's nonsense. It's without sense. No, I mean, they're they're watching the Baku. So, to give, again, a quick summary of the plot so we can just talk about the damn thing. The Federation is sneakily trying to relocate a civilization, a small civilization, in order to take away some radiation that helps make people more youthful and picard picard ain't having that no because it's a violation of the prime directive but then what does he go and do he violates the prime directive well that's no he's done it before he did it twice before in the series he relocated two different people into this one he's like we don't do that that doesn't make sense well the one time he had the re- they relocated the people with like the the, the super stereotypical native american characters yeah that was that was pretty the, bad yeah that was bad that was real bad that was <laughs> wesley's last episode no no it wasn't that one there wasn't Oh, that's the one where he meets the Traveler, I think. No, there was an episode no. that it was like they weren't Native Americans because it wasn't. But the Kadra- it was either the Cardassians they... or the Ronlians were trying to like. No, they were like straight up Native Americans in the show. It was bad, like yes. headdress and everything. Ugh. But they also had the um, Worf's brother moving the group of people. Yeah, they've done this before. Yes, and now Picard's like. This is morally <laughs> objective. Like you've done it. You've been an active participant. You have been a moderator for but, this. Oh, by the way, Data goes and messes things up and freaks out. What's Data's subplot in this one? Finding out what it means to be human. Finding out what it is to be a child. I'm trying to play. Where he pops uh, out of the hay. He pops out of the haystack. It's so bad. I know Jonathan Frakes got kind of crappy about not directing the next movie. There's a reason he didn't direct the next movie, and it's this. This garbage they all get young they feel youthful Riker shaves his beard in a hot tub they with have Troy. terrible jokes they have awful jokes about being youthful Worf gets a pimple they talk about how firm their boobs are and then Data's like how firm are my boobs <sighs> and at that point he was getting heavier so you know no. it's legitimate um yeah and, and Worf's like oh. I feel aggressive I, I have long crazy hair and Riker's and Troy are getting all frisky, and so oh, yeah, it's like they haven't. It's so stupid, and Troy's like, "I've never kissed you with a beard before." I'm like, "You've definitely done it like half a dozen times throughout the series." Shut up! I hate you so much. But then she shaves him, and he's in a tub. Yeah, with all these candles. Ah, it's so stupid. I thought that you couldn't have open flame on the Enterprise because remember in the beginning of the first season, uh, Colmini's character um, Chief O'Brien's like, "Oh, we're going to be burning the mid oil," and Dia's like, "That would be inadvisable. Igniting any petroleum substance will cause fire suppression to occur." I hate this movie. The, some other things like right away the movie jumps the shark when they're trying to like get Data back by singing songs from HMS Pinafore. Oh no, I love that. I actually enjoyed the hell out of that. Most, and in all fairness. Because the HMS Pinafore was also done in my all-time favorite Simpsons episode. Fair enough. Where Sideshow, where Bart's like, you have such a lovely voice to Sideshow Bob. Like, could you sing the entire HMS Pinafore? He's like, very well, Bart. I will send you to heaven before I send you to hell. <laughs> and the whole thing. So the HMS Pinafore I have kind of a soft spot for. So that part I actually like. I'm the very modern model of a Mary Major. <laughs> I can't remember. I, I can't not like the HMS Pinafore because of that Simpsons episode. So seeing it pop up in something else, and I love this movie isn't all bad. No movie is 100 percent bad, but I love. I'm it sure when, we could find one. Or Picard's like, "Sing, Worf, sing," and just the silent, like, "No," oh. <laughs> shaking his head. As we know, Worf isn't all about tearing music. Irving Berlin does not get his goat going. <laughs> But I do. It does if you have some that, interesting that's fine. Part. I can understand disliking the HMS Pinafore stuff, but I it just felt it. hokey. It is hokey, but I can't help but like it. This one, it, just, it it was a little hokey that they had like the karaoke ball bouncing over the lyrics because they have the lyrics projected on the screen of the ship, and it's oh, like oh yeah yeah it's yeah, like yeah, a yeah. Oh, the yeah. yeah where the ball is bouncing, and these uh, these people these 
The um, Sona or the Baku? The Baku, who are like, we don't believe in technology. Like, you have an irrigation system. That's technology. I just, uh, But it, here's the worst part. Or not the worst part. I don't even know what the worst part of this movie is. It's really hard to pin down because this movie is such a piece of crap. Like I said before, Worf... We have to find a reason for Worf to be in every one of these movies because he's off on Deep Space Nine. Yes. And in this movie, Worf literally just shows up and goes, Captain! And Picard's like, Mr. Worf, what are you doing here? And he starts to explain it and Picard just waves him away. He's like, yeah, don't worry about it. Hmm. Like, no! Well, that's Get typical. a reason! Nothing happened! That's typical of Worf, because remember that video clip I had you watch the other night? Worf gets told no a lot. There's a 15-minute YouTube video of Worf being told no. <laughs> yeah, that was, that was long. Did you watch all 15 minutes? No, I stopped at about minute six. <laughs> uh, I thought you were say the moment I walked out the door of your home. Granted, we had spent a lot of time together that day. But they start talking about, like, oh, the Dominion War and all this stuff. I'm like, don't remind me... Of better stories. <laughs> I would have loved to have seen a Star Trek Next Generation movie involving the Dominion War. Yeah, don't. And, like, their role in the Dominion. Because they mention it, too. Deep in Space Nine's amazing. I love Deep Space Nine. Man, yeah, most of it's, it's, it has that whole, like, we have to get past the first few seasons. Once we're into the goatee years, we're good. Yeah, once Avery Brooks is Captain. <laughs> once it's Captain Cisco and not Commander Cisco. <laughs> and he's not mad at Picard. But don't remind me of a better story. Not in the middle of this crap. Then we have the curse of the late 90s, all the bad CG that... Saying it hasn't aged well is an understatement. But you're also talking about... This movie was almost 20 years ago now. Yeah, but I mean, you can go back and watch something from the 80s or even the early 90s that when they're doing miniature work or practical, and you go, oh... That looks really good. They had something there compared to the days of early CG of... Like, fully rendered characters, and it's ugly and terrible and bad. What do you think of um, the Riker and Troy stuff? So we have... well, It pays off in the next movie. I want to give a little bit of back. So, if you haven't watched Star Trek, and then what's funny is I've told people we're doing this episode, and we actually have people excited about this one. Really? Yeah, people are looking forward to us doing Trek. Good on you, people. Good on you. Thanks, people. But Riker and Troy... It's here for the Ed Heads, by the way. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> a solo applause. Well, because you're too busy to clap. So here I am. My hands are full. Cheers, Ed Heads. But Riker and Troy dated before the series. They were never on. It was flirt off, mention that we've dated before, but there was never like a real on in the series. We've never... In fact, the series, s- the series leaves you thinking that Troy War- and Worf. Yeah, totally. And But then Worf got a new job. Yeah, Worf. And I a want- new wife. Yeah, I wonder... I wonder if uh, some of that had to do with the fact that Riker's like, you know what? I'll just get him transferred. <laughs> get away from my girl, Worf. Get out of here. That was weird, right? What? The Troy Worf thing? I never really... Because it just kind of came out of nowhere. Yeah, I never really bought that. It's not wrong to explore our feelings. But he's like, total bro, Worf, bro to the end. I'm just worried about Commander Riker's feelings. It really just started... In the... There was no... Troy's playing the cat and mouse game. Nothing really Troy's playing the cat and mouse game, dude. But we haven't really ever seen Riker and Troy together. Seven movie, or I'm sorry, seven seasons. Two movies have well, passed. Well, the, one, the never... time that Troy was pregnant with the alien child, Riker was all like, "We'll raise it together." Yeah. Why was that my voice for Riker? Dude, dude, he's from Alaska, it's not from <laughs> Britain. <laughs> but we have the two of them start. So, what do you think about that? Because I mean, even in my mind, like I always kind of thought about the, the two first of time them in a while. A that, I mean, we gotta, have, you gotta have some sort of romance. We didn't really have any romance or love story in generations. First contact, we kind of have data, data and the Borg Queen banging the Borg Queen. Yeah, which by by the way, he talks about. I haven't like, had sex since Tasha Yar. It's exactly. been ever. It's a long drought for data, <laughs> especially for someone who's fully functional and programmed in multiple yeah, techniques. That was weird. He didn't even say that. Uh, that's just because it's a reiteration of the line that he sexed up Tasha Yar in the first season. Not good. So he Bad. went. He went the next six and a half seasons of that show, and then however it's probably two years after. Which, by the way, I mean, were they planning to build the Enterprise E? They've already had to have started to build the Enterprise E at the time that the Enterprise D was destroyed because they were in space for a year. Union work, baby! Which also begs the question, were they getting ready to mothball the D anyway? This movie... Okay, so you actually know. Riker and Troy, what do you think? (laughs) It makes sense. It makes the most sense. You've got to... I mean, everyone's feeling useful, uh, youthful... And love is in the air. So who are you going to shack up? She's not going to shack up with Data. She's not going to get back with Worf because Worf's been married at this point. 
uh, to uh, Dax. All right. She's I think not she was gonna dead get Picard. at this point, though. She may have been dead, but because this came out in '98 and Deep Space Nine ended in '99. So she's, okay, but Worf's not gonna like you know jump back in the saddle with. Worf has a real issue with wives dying. Yes, he does. He's over two, <laughs> <laughs> with one kid to show for it. Whatever happened to Alexander? Uh, he sucked, so I don't care. Okay, except for the episode where he came back from the future. It was yeah. You know, possibilities for Troy to get together. Why not Crusher and Picard? Because that's always been hinted at. That never happened at all in the movie series, and I was kind of surprised about that. Yeah, especially where the future timeline has him and Beverly getting married and, and then divorced. divorced. So, I mean, logically, who does she have a past with that she can connect with? Riker. So it makes sense. Yeah. What do you think about the whole bathtub shaving scene? I was actually going to say being as smooth as an android's bottom. Again, the movie's... The movie's held handcuffed. I don't like it. Some bad, it's held cuffed, it's handcuffed to bad writing and a bad script with corny jokes. I've had a beard they, for as long as I can grow a beard. Don't take that away. No. I I like Riker with a beard. Riker, beardless Riker? No. Riker's got to have a beard. Although also, season, season also the two Sona beards. suck. Yeah, the skin stretching and all that stuff. Yeah, let's not even... We didn't even talk about that. They suck. I would say if you're a really big... Ah! Okay. Whatever. Yeah, you so, know what I'm talking yeah. about. Truck fan, I would say, pressing along with this massive episode. Do something better with your life. Red box it. I, you're being more generous than me. Well, you know, if we, if you and I had to suffer, they have to suffer too. I, I suffered in theaters. Four years past. Jonathan Frakes, he, Out. he gets a swift kick in the ass. Yes. He He's done. No more Frakes. And how this movie kind of fell down critically... <laughs> Probably can't cut the se- the series from a fifth movie. No, no, this was the marketing was the final. Was it the final for, mission or for something? For Nemesis, rather? it was like right on the posters. Yeah, no, yeah. Nemesis was no, but marketed be- as the last next generation. Yeah, movie. there's a reason why there was four years in between because the movie panned so badly. Oh my god! And at that point, they're like, okay, we're not going to do a fifth anymore. Let's reset ourselves and do a really good final movie. That's what was marketed as the Generation's Final Journey. But they wanted to have it to be like a two-part kind of search for Spock thing because they knew that Data was going to die. Brent Spiner helped write the, the movie script. And they wanted to explore before assimilating Data's stuff and yeah. seeing the Enterprise without Riker on and all that. Which, so this movie comes out December 2002, directed by Stuart Baird? Yes, yeah, Stuart Baird. This is the last movie he ever directed. He still work. He's an editor. He still works. But this yeah. is one of three movies he's ever directed. He did this, U.S. Marshals, which is the most, at least I haven't had cable in years. And when I had cable, it was the most overplayed cable movie in I existence. I like U.S. Marshals. Look, I just remember cable from like the early 2000s really overplayed. Oh, well, it's really overplayed because it's basically The Fugitive, but with a different guy. And, and Robert Downey Jr. Robert Downey Jr. And Tommy Lee Jones. Yeah, because he was the U.S. Marshal. I love Tommy Lee Jones. This movie, yeah, I think it says a lot that he's never directed since this movie. I remember it being really close. We looked it up a couple of days ago when we watched this. This movie had the unfortunate timing of coming out a week before The Two Towers. And a week after Harry Potter. <laughs> and she, like, this movie had no chance. This movie had the mark of death. Oh, yeah. Very, very poor timing. Very, yeah, very there poor was timing. December 2002. Whew! Not the time to come out as a movie. No. Speaking as a movie on its own right, this is my second favorite of the Next Generation series. Oh, uh, ooh. It's tough. It's it's up there. I like Generations. Uh, Generations is probably third. Yeah, because Insurrection has to be last. Yes. But, By default, Generations, but Generations is, is third. Like, it's third. Oh, well, this podcast is the best in Central Maine by default, but... yeah. yeah. But Generations, I feel like it should finish higher than the third, but it just, I don't know. It won't. I know it won't. This movie opens up with Riker and Troy's wedding. There's been a relationship that we haven't seen. Yes, and they're married. And we get Wesley Crusher in the wedding party. Like, get out of there, Wesley. Go back with the Traveler. And, well, he's back in Starfleet. He's yeah, in go uniform. back to having no lines. Uh, I appreciate that about you. Pretty much, the movie, the movie's a one big shut up, Wesley. Because get he's out never, of here, Will we? He's never allowed to speak. But I do, I do like the way they do the best man speech because it gives a ton of exposition about where the whole cast of characters are, what's yeah. going to be going on there. It was, a, I thought it was a good way to sneak it in. And then they, we didn't mention this, but um, it wasn't clunky exposition; it was smooth. Yeah, it works. We didn't mention this before, but in First Contact, we get a few of kind of supporting Next Generation characters. We get, I'm blanking on the nurse's name. 
Uh, Alyssa was the nurse. And then we also had um, Reg. Yes. First contact. But then this one, we get Guinan. We get the hairdresser. Mott. Yeah, there we go. So it's nice seeing some of those supporting characters oh, there. Yeah. Also Wesley, technically. I mean, we get yeah. a little bit of everyone in the scene. This movie, though, it does reek of studio interference. Oh, yeah. Star Trek by itself in this movie is kind of the last classic Trek movie. Because the new ones, well, we'll talk about those next time. But this is the last one that has that Trek, that classic Trek to it. And mm. you can see people like producers or studios going like, there isn't enough action in this. You need to add some more action scenes to grab people. And they're so out of context and useless. So we get the Argo. Oh my god, we get the Argo with... Which is nothing but a doom buggy with someone who definitely isn't Patrick Stewart driving it. With a totally unnecessary action sequence that does nothing for the plot. Except and also, for... the Prime Directive. Apparently the Prime Directive doesn't care if you kill the natives. Yes. In that scene. Also, well, you missed a key point. The movie starts up with a shake-up in the Romulan Senate. The Romulan Praetor is assassinated by oh, yeah. someone from Remus. This is the first time we've ever really seen the Romulan homeworld. The first time we've seen the Romulan... Well, we kind of see the Romulan homeworld in the... Um... And reunification, the two-part episode of reunification. Well, okay, that's Cause true. Because there's Spock in the underground. But this is the first time we see, like, inside the Romulan Senate, we get a feeling of the workings of the Romulan government. This is the most in-depth we've seen. Because, yeah, you're right, we did see it in reunification. And that was, but that was mostly the underground. Which I love, by the way, in the beginning, spoiler, if you haven't read the Star Trek book, what's the name of the book? Countdown. Countdown. Um, it picks, it hits on some of that continuity. We're going to talk about that next week. I'm so excited to talk about that book. Because I'm actually going to like really read it with focus. I told you, you were going to like that book. Yes. Because I got, and I think I already told you some of the points of it, but I got like so giddy. Really like, good. Oh, that's what happened? Yes. Because like, if you've seen Star Trek The Next Generation and you've seen the reunification episode, it it holds true to the canon, which I liked. And you hit up a lot of those characters after Nemesis, which is so good. Okay. But we're going to get into that. We got This is the longest show we've done. Easily. Damn Star Trek. Because um, we love it. So, again, I'm going to give a quick summary, and then I'm going to ask, what was Data Subplot? Wait, uh, wait, let me tell you. Trying to be more human. <laughs> no, it's having a mirror image and making a derp face. Well, it's also looking at his progress of humanity, but we'll get to that in a second. Quick summary of this movie. The Romulan Empire has someone take it over the federation goes to examine it it turns out that um picard had a clone made of him that is played by a young tom skinny tom hardy who can't act and has terrible teeth which definitely got fixed later on and this young praetor shinzon slash clone of picard feels that he needs to kill picard to become the real picard and he's gonna go destroy the federation and earth well he doesn't feel he needs to he has to he needs picard's blood destiny which by the way we also get ron perlman yeah we get uh ron perlman before he was famous and he was famous before that because he was in uh like a tv series like beauty and the beast yeah one ron perlman's career was based on him being under makeup this is like pre hellboy ron perlman playing someone uh what were they called I mean, I know it was the Remans. They're Remans, yeah. What was his... He was the Viceroy. The Viceroy. That's such a He's cool... the Reman Viceroy. Uh, yeah, he was on Beauty and the Beast from 1987 to 1990. He was in Blade 2 in 2002. Electric Boogaloo. Alien Insurrection. Tom Alien Hart. Insurrection? What's was that? In Alien, in uh, Alien Resurrection, sorry. Oh, Resurrection. Oh, yeah, he was in Alien Resurrection. That movie sucks. He was also in uh, The Name of the Rose. Sweden. He was in Conan the Barbarian. Oh, in 2011. Sorry. I didn't see that one. Ron Perlman was in this movie. It's weird that he's just fully under makeup. And unless you know that it's Ron Perlman, you would never know it's Ron Perlman. You can hear his voice. Like, once you say, oh, that's Ron Perlman, and you listen, you can hear the voice. So what's weird about this is Tom Hardy is playing a young cloned Picard. And they balled up Tom Hardy. Like, that's the defining Picard thing. We've seen the young Picard in flashbacks where he has hair and looks nothing like that. And they treat it like the Remans the opposite of the Romulans, like, live in low light, and they do this full reveal where they bring up the lights, like, this has no context. We don't know what... I mean, we know what Young Picard's supposed to look like if you had to watch the show, but just going, there's a bald guy in his late 20s doesn't say, hey, that's a Young Picard. I feel like somewhere I either read or was explained that he that he was bald for, like, a reason. Like, there was an explanation for it No, we saw him, though, in that flashback where he got stabbed in the heart. By the Nossigan? Yes. Yeah, he had hair. He had hair, yes. But I feel like he was... 
there was like an explanation as to why he was bald for no, a time. No, it was just Because he didn't get stabbed by the Gnostic until after he graduated from the academy. It was just lazy going like, well, he's bald, so we have to make sure the two of them look together. They do have similar noses. Yes. So what was Data's subplot? His subplot was examining his, yeah, examining his humanity. Because How again, so? Well, you got B4 and what him. The, and he's what's able, B4? B4 is a prototype of Data, which Data downloads all his information into. It's kind of like what yeah, draws they found, them. Um, for those who haven't watched Star Trek, Data has a positronic brain, which has never been able to be duplicated except by the same guy who did it multiple times. Yes. And we found yet another android that he built with the cutesy name of B4. B4. Which leads you to believe that he's, you know... Which just has Brent Spiner doing a derp face. Well, again... <sighs> I Yes. But it's it, it allows Data to examine how far he's come. Oh my god, I just hit the studio. Stop hitting my mics! There's an earthquake. It allows Data to examine how far he's come. And it ultimately leads him to doing like one of the ultimate acts of humanity at the end of the movie. Jumping through space. Yes, jumping through space. Everyone does that. But Data finds... And B4 is physically a duplicate of Data. Well, so is Lore. I'm just saying it for the people who haven't seen the movie. This okay. movie did do good numbers. A lot of people have not seen this movie. We gotta break it down. We gotta bring him in. So yeah, he makes the derp face, but it's Data examining his humanity and how far he's come. But before, also nefarious because he is actually being used by Shinzon to capture Captain Picard and bring him on the Scimitar, a Scimitar, which is so he can use his blood to not be a dying clone. to not die. And it also um, the but Scimitar. But by the end of the movie, Shinzon don't give a crap. Like Shinzon knows he's gonna die anyway, and it becomes more about being the echo through eternity. Well, where the shadow beats the man or some crap like that. It's really over the top. But the other thing here is the big thing they got to stop is the scimitar, which has Daleron radiation, which kills any... It turns it into stone, pretty it's much. It's totally made up for that. I mean, it's all of the Star Trek yeah, technology. Yeah, all the Star up. Trek technobabble. But it was just like, <gasps> super bad radiation! But it also brings up... like The whole movie brings up an interesting point, right? Because it's very much a mirror, again, like I've said earlier in the episode, between Data and Picard. Because Picard's looking at a clone of himself, and it's the nurture versus nature. But Data even says it out loud. Like, they don't even allow you to interpret it. Data just comes out and tells you. Yes. He's like, hey, if you didn't pick up on this, this is what we're doing here. You guys up to date? Yeah, okay, I'm downloading my, all my memories into B4. But he would not be me. Side note, if you haven't read Countdown, it's just Data. It's just Data? It's just, yeah, it's just Whatever, I'm spoiling it for you. Whatever, it's I'll get data. to the point. Uh, well, remember, alternate timeline. That one's not. Countdown, isn't it? Countdown oh, right, because it leads into... Timeline. Oh, yeah, good point. Well, remember, it also brings up, like I was telling you when we were watching it, the argument of the transporter. Because the transporter basically kills you. Yeah. And then reassembles you. Which is why Bones ain't about that. No. So, I, I mean, every time you use the transporter, yeah... You're reassembled, but is it really you? So that's the question with Data and B4. Yeah, Data put all of his memories into B4. Could that really be Data? Or is that really going to be B4? Just like Picard was cloned. It's all of the same. He has the same everything, right? But Shinzon's such a different person than Picard, so it's the nurture versus nature. It's really interesting if you really dive into the psychology of the movie, which you didn't because you're like all concerned about other things like Data's, you know, B4's derp face. There's some really interesting psychology in this movie. I hope that the Ed heads recognize that I'm having a little bit of intellect this week. Is that what we're calling it? I'm drinking... So at the end of the movie, which I don't know if we've said or not, Data sacrifices himself after Picard kills Shinzon. Yes. In the identical way that Aragorn killed that orc the year before. Yeah, I don't think you're looking too much into that. Where the orc pulled himself on the sword and then... Yeah, Shinzon pulled himself on that beam. It was, it's like, but that's been done before. That was done in Excalibur when they fell too close together. Yeah, but no, it's been done before because if, if you seen the remember the movie Excalibur, which also had Patrick Stewart in it, tying it all together. Here's a deep cut for you. Like Excalibur came out in like the early '80s uh, when King yeah, Arthur hair. kills what? Oh, I think it was a wig, wasn't it? What was that a wig? Let's say it was a wig. What Picard? Yeah. Well, or Stewart in yeah, the movie Excalibur? Not. Yeah. Yeah, Patrick Stewart had hair. That wasn't a total wig. He was born bald. No, he wasn't. Yes, he was. All babies are. Uh, 
Yes, but ah, he, I he, caught you. He did have hair. I've trapped you in my web of baldness and wigs. Son of a gun. No, but in the movie Excalibur, when Arthur kills Mordred, Mordred pulls himself closer on the spear. So it's not... It's not new, but it felt... It just swore it was within that far enough of a time they could like, yeah, they could have filmed this afterwards. It was a little meh. Yeah, but again, two movies with Patrick Stewart in which someone gets impaled and pulls themselves closer to their killer. Anyway, Data jumps from the Enterprise over to the Scimitar. He asks his best friend for life, uh, contact lens wearing Jordy, to make it so he can do it. And I don't like the scene where Jordy says goodbye to Data because they don't really do anything. Jordy knows that Data's going to die. Oh, yeah. And they just do. And I can't do it on the show. It's just a silent nod. Hey. The relationship with those two was such a huge part of the show. What if I what if I were to, like, you know, jump in, like, there was a car careening toward you and it was going to kill you and I just look at you and said, okay, I'm just going to go do this and save you. You wouldn't just, like, nod? I won't go to your funeral. Wow. <laughs> I just killed, I, I gave my life to save you and you wouldn't go to my funeral? Unless I could be, like, of all the souls I've ever known, his was the most <clears throat> human. No. And then I played the bagpipes. I need to learn how to play the bagpipes first. But Kirk didn't play the bagpipes. I need to do it all. I'm that selfish. Would you put me in a photon torpedo and shoot me towards a really brand new form planet? No. That sounds expensive. The bagpipe thing sounds cheaper. I'm not going to jump in front of a car for you then. <laughs> there we go. Thanks for talking me down off the ledge. <laughs> <laughs> this sounds expensive. I'm not helping financially. Oh, well then to hell with you. <laughs> to hell with you. Oh my god, no. Can we do a Conan episode? We could, I guess. Because there are Conan comics. Yeah, there are. Conan the Slayer number one comes out tomorrow. Tomorrow being Thursday or tomorrow being Wednesday? Oh, I guess tomorrow being today after I cut the show. Oh. Cool. Anyway. But, so, Data dies. What, how do you feel about the whole Data death thing? Somebody had to die. They've, they've gone too long, and the last major cast member to die died halfway through the first season. Yeah. All right, so they've... They listen. Despite everything that this crew's been through, their safety record is relatively high. Somebody who wasn't a red shirt had to go. Hashtag red shirt lives matter. Hashtag nothing. Yes, about. but it's logical to kill Data because they gave themselves an exit point if they ever needed to bring him back because they downloaded all of his information into B4. So they gave themselves a safety net if people ever wanted hashtag we want Data. But well, you're not. You can't. You're not going to kill Worf. Because Worf's not in a position to, like, sacrifice himself. He's too popular. Well, he's, he's too, too popular as a character. Yeah, well, Data's popular, too. But they you gave can't... themselves an out. That was five minutes of Data's death. I know he's not. They did give themselves a huge out. I think it would have had more weight if Picard died. But nobody would buy it. I think people would leave bitter that Picard died. We want, like, we envision Picard becoming an ambassador at some point. Which, by the way, you think he's, like, or an admiral. Wait, did you get that far in the book yet? No. I'm not going to spoil it, then. We envisioned him becoming an ambassador or an admiral at some point. We've already lived up. Riker's going to be captain of the Titan until Jean-Luc's done on the Enterprise. And you know that Riker's going to end up back on the Enterprise. Although I know in the book he doesn't. but Because yeah. there's no Riker in this comic. God damn it. I already ruined that. Yeah. Well, I like, it's a good book. I, I'm excited. I'm sure it's a good book. I just love me some friggin' Riker. I know you do. Intergalactic pimp. But we, you know, gloss over the fact that Riker once had sex with an alien to get out of a hospital ward. That was weird. I'll let you know next time I'm in the sector. But the movie, so Data dies, so, yeah, you but can't. they have an out of all of his memories were downloaded into B4 earlier. And they hint that Data may return in yeah. this identical body that has all of his memories. Because he starts, he was processing all of that information. Starts singing the song that he was singing earlier in the movie. Ever seen the sun? Shining so bright. Um, seen things. They did have. There's a really good cutscene. Really I wish they had. Right. I wish they had included, where Picard comes back out into the bridge, meets his new first officer. Riker sets yeah, yeah. him up to fail. Like, you know, oh, Captain Picard likes things real casual. Call him Jean Luc. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember that. And the seatbelt chair. Because you were saying, when are they gonna put seatbelts on those chairs? Which they make. They come back around to have. And the new... they have like get shot every other day. And people are like flying out. She's like, get a seatbelt on there. Yeah, it's think like, about why that. Your school moving... buses have seatbelts. It's insane. You're moving faster than the speed of light. If you come to a sudden stop, you technically should go flying through. You should be liquidated or have some precautions. Jeez. But the movie ends, and, it, and we go from a sad note into a hopeful note. Because we get the we get the sweeping theme. I like it. The movie. It's a movie that reeks of studio interference. 
But at the same time, it works as a finale. It has a nice level of nostalgia. It doesn't wrap things up as nicely as All Good Things does. No. But, but if know, I were to say, I'd say, see this in theaters, and then go to Two Towers a week later and feel disappointed by Star Trek. Well, again, you're going to two different types of movies. You're going to one of the a biggest... good one? You're going to one of... Okay, so you're watching Star Trek, which has limited eyes, and then you're going to go watch... The Two Towers, which had a tremendous following, is adapted from one of the greatest literary works of all time. Second highest book, or The Lord of the Rings, second highest book selling behind the Bible. Yes. So, one of the most popular literary works of all time, save the the hand of God. So, I want to take you back in time to when this came out. This was, I don't remember what year high school was, it was either my sophomore or junior, I'm not going to When this that. movie, when Nemesis came out? Or rep, uh, O2? Whatever. No, O2 would be the beginning of my, either the end of my junior year or beginning of my senior year of high school. Sometime in high school for So it would be like your freshman year. But I remember um, this movie came up in conversation, so it's something about data. Like, no, but data died, but then he might have come back as, and I'm in an honors algebra 2 math class. Like, but data might come back because it'd be four, blah, blah. And like, I just remember everyone looking at me like, you nerd. When you're in the middle of an honors algebra 2 class and people are looking at you like, damn nerd. <laughs> oh, God, no. In that same class, it was, um, our teacher, like, a bunch of us went to go see Lord of the Rings opening night, and the teacher asked, like, very condescendingly, how many of you have even read these books? And my hand shot up, and I'm the only hand. I'm like, oh, no. Were you one of the guys that dressed up to a midnight showing? No, I just went. To a midnight showing? I don't think it was a midnight, but it was opening day. Uh. Might have been midnight, but either way, I was like, oh, I'm the only one who's read these books. I saw Return of the King twice in, like, 24 hours when it came out. It was so sad. Like, between Star Trek and Lord of the Rings... This is an honors math class, and I'm the nerdy one? Wow, your level of indignation is... I'm not the smart one. That class sucked. I hate math. Thank you for that jog down memory lane. I mean, Jesus, more than, like, two-digit addition gets me. And you run a goddamn business. I'm a CFO. <laughs> You're a lot of things. <laughs> not all positive. I'd say C... I'll give this a red box. Ooh, no. Theater. Red box this one. Theater. I think that uh, there's some really good shots in that movie, though. But like watching that on your 4K TV with Blu-ray, like that shot with the scimitar and the Enterprise are looking at each other, and the debris everywhere after they crash into each other. That's such a great shot. Three of the four are seen theaters. Insurrection. I would red box, but that's where I stand. God, I love Star Trek. God, I love it. Any letters to the editor? Did I mention how much I love Star Trek? I love that at the end, though, we kind of like, everyone's going off on their way. Troy and Riker are going off on the Titan. You know, Worf is back on the Enterprise. But again, it doesn't really ever explain why Worf has been transferred back to the Enterprise. You would think, like, as a commander, he'd be like a captain at this point. Or, here's another question I have to pose to you. All right, so Data was in line to become the new first officer. Why? Okay, again, poor Worf. Why wouldn't Worf be next in line to become first officer of the Enterprise? Or Geordi, okay? Now they got to bring somebody from the outside in? You ever think Worf got pissed off that he got looked over for promotion to be the friggin' first officer of the Enterprise? After commanding the Defiant? After being pretty much the first officer on Deep Space Nine? All right, letters to the editor. You gotta answer my question about Worf! I wasn't listening. I pretty much droned on about how, okay, so Data's gonna be the first officer of the Enterprise, and he dies. So the next logical choice would be Worf, right? Because he's like the highest ranking guy left. No, they go elsewhere and pull in somebody else to be first officer. We don't know where Worf is at that point. It's not really explained. He just shows up for the wedding and then he's working on the Enterprise again. We have no idea. There's no context. Oh, maybe he's yeah. Maybe he's just hitching around in the Enterprise to the ceremony on Beta Z, which we totally glossed over. That the wedding on Beta Z, everyone's naked. That's unfortunate. That's not things I want to see. Well, I'm, I think weddings would be more fun if everyone. Well, no, probably wouldn't be more fun than they already are. They're pretty fun. That would make weddings terrible. I like weddings. Uh, we are moving on. Letters to the editor. Here's your letters to the editors. To submit your questions, email us at editorsnotecomics at gmail.com. This will be a tough one for you, but I'm going to do it anyway. Oh, jeez. Because I've been on point all night about Star Trek? Yeah, actually, I should throw a more complicated one your way. Oh, uh, no, no, please don't. Which comic book or character would you like to see adapted to the big screen that hasn't been already done? <laughs> he looks so distressed like how do i know hmm i mean you read um you could even give an answer i mean new frontier had a fair number of characters that guy that did a swan dive into the t-rex 
we're going to see that in Suicide Squad. Oh. Well, we're going to see um, his son anyway. That was Rick Flag. A comic book character or series that hasn't been brought to the big screen yet. I mean, you've be. seen ones like that. You There was even... Well, you read... We can go off a new frontier. There was... Even though we know we're seeing it, like there was The Flash. There was Martian Manhunter. There was... Well, Flash has kind of been on the big screen. Flash has been on TV. Oh, I didn't even mention that in the news. Wally West. We saw his costume today for the first time. Looks good. They're doing... They're going full ears on that compared to The Flash's costume. He has full pointy ears sticking out of the side of his head. Good on them. Oh, thank you. Even... I mean, God, to a point, I didn't even to say, even though we saw it technically, you could even say Green Lantern because we didn't see a good Green Lantern. But it's already or been done. you didn't say Wonder Woman. I mean... I'll, well, no, because we got Wonder Woman. Not since Linda Carter. But, oh, no, you're right, Batman yeah. and Superman. Yeah, it always comes back to BVSD. Um, that sounds like a bad underwear. But it always comes back to Batman versus Superman. Uh, ooh, comic book character adapted to the big screen that we haven't already seen. I, I don't know. I don't know. You got nothing? I really don't. <laughs> it's okay. I'll, get, I'll give two answers then to fill in for your nothing. I feel inadequate. It's okay. Only because you are. What about Mysterio? How about Mysterio as a villain? For Spider-Man. There you go. I'd take Mysterio. Give it something a bit different. Someone who's a little less punchy. Give it a little more... Cerebral? Yeah. There you go. Mysterio. Haha. Um, I would give two... I have two properties I'd really like to see adapted that there isn't a lot of headway being made on either one. Both of them have been rumored in the past, but we nothing's ever come to fruition. One of them being Why the Last Man. Why the Last Man, I think it was 60 issues. It came out, it was written by Brian K. Vaughn, who his current big thing is working on Saga. He also used to work on Lost back in the day. The Why the Last Man is a book about a character named Yorick Brown and his monkey Ampersand. Yes, you showed me at the shop once. I might have, yeah. I'm sure, because it's a great series. But something happens, and half of the population is killed. All of the men are killed, except for Yorick for some reason. And so he has to repopulate the planet. No, it's not that oh. at all, but... Well, I mean... He should get on that. It's about, like... I don't even want to get into it, but it's about, you know, why the last man, you know, why chromosome, Yorick, the last man, all that kind of stuff. It's an amazing... It's self-contained at 60 issues. I've, there's been rumors of it being a trilogy of movies or a TV show. There was a rumor of it being Shia LaBeouf, which would be terrible. But why the last man would be an amazing series to adapt and if that ever happens it'd be great i think the movie right lapsed back to the creator i feel like enough time had passed that it went back to him if i remember right um the other one i would like to see would be runaways this was a marvel property that they utilized the first 24 issues are amazing also weirdly enough brian k vaughn <laughs> it's just gonna be brian k vaughn stuff but it was a group of teenagers who discover their parents are super villains Ooh. In that the, sounds intriguing. In the Marvel Universe. And then they, as the title would say, run away. And they have to like develop their own powers and skills. And this includes um, this one character, Nika, who, who has the staff of one. And she's a witch. And she can cast any spell in the world. But she can only cast that spell once. So there's a workaround there. There's also a telepathic dinosaur. And there's scrolls and there's crazy cosmic light show powers and all this great stuff. But it's a really neat property that kind of lives on the outskirts of the Marvel Universe. It almost feels like an indie book, but it isn't. I, I came up with my answer. Okay. The unbeatable squirrel girl. Anna Kendrick said she'd want to play that. Main native Anna Kendrick. Representing the Pine Tree State. Here's the tagline, by the way. He, she's here to eat some nuts, kick some butts, and fly somewhat. <laughs> I would watch that it's movie a in a goddamn heartbeat. It's a silly book, but they have fun with it. All right. Uh, any other letters to the editor or no? I do, but I want to save them. Oh. Look, we don't. I I have a small pool saving. Um, I had a tweet that I was thinking about using, but I'm not gonna. Oh, the one where I was called Jerry Six Inch again? No, not the one where you were called out for not reading Watchmen. I had another oh. one. Reading recommendations, by the way, for Star Trek. Let's put a smile on that face. This week's reading recommendations. I would say Star Trek Countdown. There's also a current ongoing Star Trek series, or for the 50th anniversary, there was Star Trek Manifest Destiny. It was a four-part series. But Star Trek Countdown, we're going to talk about in our next episode, acts as the bridge between the Star Trek universe, 
that was the core universe and what transitions us into the J.J. Abrams alternate universe that is, you know, the only thing that's out right now. Nice. Well, I will immediately read that. You should. Excellent. Where can we find you? Time to plug. Uh, you can find me at editorsnotecomics.com, at editorsnotecomics on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Google Play, YouTube, iTunes, and physically at my store location. Yes. You're not going to be open this Saturday. No, that's right. I'm going to be closed on Saturday. Closed on Saturday, unfortunately, for Hollow All Day. Yeah, but... on only the most popular day within this town. Oh. All right, where are you at? Uh, I'm at Junior Rich on Twitter and at most Pokemon gyms around the central main area now. Oh, yeah, you're on the Pokemon Go thing. I just started today. I don't know how long it's going to last. Let's be honest here. We, like, we talked about that two hours ago. Yes. All the Pokemon I could have caught in the last two hours have escaped me. There's nothing here. Yeah, no, because if there were, I would have already caught them. <laughs> uh, All right, that will do it for this week. We'll be back next week somehow, some way. You make it sound like there's a significant chance of like the Earth ending. Or the podcast getting, like, shut down by the authorities. No, we're just not going to have that much time in between episodes. But we will see you next week where we talk about Star Trek. We're on a Star Trek kick. Oh, live kids. long and prosper, baby. Live long and prosper. You do, the, you do it wrong. you got to have the thumb, thumb out. out. Thumb in, thumb out. No, the thumb is out. Thumbs you, out. You do the thumb in, and it looks like this weird clamshell thing you're doing with your hands. I'm kind of like a Ninja Turtle hand. Yeah. No, it's not, because it's still only two, because your thumb's in. Thumb out. Oh, yeah? Well, here's one finger for you. Have a good week, everybody. <laughs> there you go. See you next time. Bye.